right, everybody. Welcome once again to Avalanche Creates, the first event of its kind. I hope you are all having a great day one so far and are looking forward to all of the fun and exciting talks and events that will be happening over the next several days. My name is Amanda Marquis. I am a part of the product support team here at Avalanche and I interact with the community quite a bit in terms of the help desk ticketing and if you reach out to any of us on Twitter via DM, any of the main Twitter accounts, that's really how you connect with me and my team and I get to work a lot with the core products that we have. So today we're going to do a very brief and basic overview of Solidity and talk about it in terms of building smart contracts and why it is a very helpful tool to add to your skill set if you are a developer. And we'll also be talking briefly a bit about some of the different tools that are currently available to get started with that learning process or continue on to use on a regular basis afterwards. As a disclaimer, I personally use the tools that I mentioned here in this talk today very frequently and I have since I started my Solidity journey. So I can personally vouch for them that even if you are not a skilled developer and you're still just kind of getting started, they are great tools for anybody to use. So to start from the beginning, we're gonna talk about smart contracts and what they are. In a brief description, a smart contract can be defined as a digital agreement between two or more parties. Unlike traditional contracts, you do not need a third party to be able to go in and verify the validity of the transactions. Smart contracts are governed by their own code and they do all of that decision making on their own. It is a very black and white process with very limited gray area in terms of if certain conditions are not met, then the transaction itself is not going to execute. It is a if this, then that scenario with little room for negotiation. If you think of it in terms of like a garage sale, you might find an item that you really like there, but you're just a few dollars short. More than likely, you can walk up to the person hosting the garage sale and say, hey, really like this item. Would you maybe come down a dollar or two because I'm a little bit short and see if they'll actually sell it to you. That works in the real world, but unlike smart contracts, you won't be able to negotiate with a contract to make them bring down the price of an item. If you do not pass it enough money or pass it the right gas fee, it will likely fail, give you an error message, and it's up to you as the instigator of that contract to figure out where it went wrong, make the necessary changes, and then try the transaction again. When I'm talking about smart contracts, one of the very basic comparisons that I like to make is talking about it in terms of a vending machine. You don't have to walk up to a cash register, deal with a cashier and exchange money with them to then have somebody else hand you food as if you were at a restaurant. You give it your money and it will give you the item that you are looking for. So for example, say you want the can of water that's in there and that water is $1.50 and it is in spot A1 of the vending machine. What happens if you only give it a dollar? You put a dollar in the machine and you hit A1, it's not going to dispense that water to you because you haven't met all of the conditions that need to be in place to be able to execute this transaction that you want. You can repeatedly hit A1 multiple times and no matter how many times you hit it, you are not going to be given that water until you reevaluate how much money you've put in and add the additional money that is necessary. One of the very nice things about the smart contract though is once those prices are defined and the smart contract's deployed, if it takes you 10 minutes to find the extra 50 cents or it takes you an hour because you have to leave and come back, you know that that price is not going to go up in the meantime. Nobody is there to be that middleman to say, oh, sorry, you took too long. We're gonna add an extra dollar to the price still leaving you short not being able to execute that contract. And once you do actually get the money and meet that initial criteria of $1.50 and press A1, you don't have to worry about suddenly getting an orange juice instead of the water. There's not a person working at a restaurant that's different from the cashier you interacted with in the first place that hands you a different drink you know that once you press A1, the only option of beverage that you're going to be get is the one that you requested being the water. So 
Not all vending machines work this way, but for the sake of this example, it gives you a receipt once the transaction is done. In terms of smart contracts, that would be your transaction ID. You can see how much money you put into the vending machine, you can see what button you hit to get the beverage, and you can see what beverage was then given to you at what time of day, what day of the year, and so forth. So, in terms of smart contracts, why is recording these transactions important? Smart contracts will store all of these actions in a transaction on the blockchain. So, in terms of a vending machine, say it was its own smart contract, I used it, I bought a bottle of water for $1.50 and then somebody immediately after me came up, wanted to buy another bottle of water. They did the same thing, put $1.50 in, pressed A1, they get their receipt and they move on with their day. The smart contract is always going to store those transactions and no matter how long it is between use of the vending machine, whether you use it today and you don't come back and use it for a year, those records are still going to be there because it is stored on a smart contract. All transactions are recorded. It doesn't matter if there are 100 transactions in a day or 100 transactions in a year. It will make sure that everything is recorded so there's always a history available to know who used it, when it was used, and how it was used. And these transactions will always be visible. Now, if you were to get a paper receipt from a vending machine, there are tons of ways that you could end up losing that receipt. Maybe it gets wet and you can't read the print anymore. Maybe it gets thrown away. Maybe it accidentally lands in a paper shredder and you can no longer read that information. Smart contracts, because they're digital, don't have those type of problems. You will get a transaction ID when you use a smart contract and you can always navigate to an explorer for the blockchain that the smart contract is deployed on, enter that transaction ID, and you will always find the information from when you bought a bottle of water out of this metaphorical vending machine. So, these type of contracts are very important in terms of a lot of the up and coming NFT space, most likely, that is what is the most common that you'll typically see on Crypto Twitter. But there are more reasons than just the fun NFTs as to why you should learn how to code a smart contract. If you are a new developer and you are new to the Web3 space in general, learning Solidity and how to make smart contracts is a very easy tool to learn how smart contracts interact with the blockchain in general. You'll be able to see how these transactions are stored on the blockchain. You'll be able to see how each individual action is stored within the transaction. And you'll also be able to see the stack of blocks and all of the other transactions that happen and be able to see the sequence of events of how it is all recorded. Another great thing about learning smart contracts and why you should start building with them is you will get a feel of how to deploy on a testnet environment before you deploy on a mainnet environment. Personally, as my smart contract coding journey has progressed, I have deployed a lot of smart contracts on the Fuji testnet that are defunct, that might have little small errors in them, that might have just tiny, tiny bugs that I didn't notice right away, but once I started interacting with those smart contracts, I noticed them. The thing about smart contracts is unless coded specifically to be mutable, they will always be immutable. Once the code is deployed on the smart contract, there's no way to go in and change them. So even if you deploy a smart contract on day one of learning, 100 days later you've learned quite a lot and know how to fix the mistakes you made day one, you won't be able to go back and upgrade that smart contract. One of my personal favorite reasons of why learning smart contract coding is very important is you get to use very exciting languages, tools, and technologies that are all rapidly growing. Smart contracts, like I said, are very commonly used in NFTs and GameFi at this point, but that is not the only thing they are used for. As the Web3 space grows, there are tools that are developing rapidly and growing exponentially to help bring new developers into the space and help them gain all the confidence they can to be able to 
build these really fancy smart contracts and build these type of projects and form teams that can help them really make a difference. And being able to use these tools and kind of see the space as it grows because I still believe that this space is very early. It's a great time to be able to get in, get your feet wet and play around as many other people are doing it at the same time and be able to kind of grow with the space. So those are definitely more of the technical reasons of why it's great if you are learning to code and you want to learn Solidity, but there are some of the fun reasons too. Like I said, this skill is a very in-demand skill in the crypto space. I know a lot of people who love NFTs and are fantastic artists and would really love to launch projects, but they don't know how to code, so they can't release the project that they hope to without finding some developers that do know Solidity that might be charging a pretty penny to do so for them. I know a lot of people who do know how to code Solidity smart contracts that get a lot of DMs from lots of people who want to launch projects that they simply can't have the time to be able to create for all of these projects, so they have to be very selective with what they do. We are still early enough in the crypto NFT space that anybody in this room learned it right now, there could be exponential growth in the NFT space. We have already had exponential growth this year, as I'm sure you all have seen, but I do believe that it could still grow at a very exponential rate if even 10 more people learned how to code Solidity smart contracts. Another one that's very fun is it gives you the opportunity to make new friends and build new projects in the crypto space. I have seen people who are in other crypto communities come into Avalanche simply because they really want to get into the NFT space. They've seen the hype on Twitter. They've seen the marketplaces really start to grow. And they've just put the word out there and said, hey, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a community manager. I'm looking for a smart contract developer. I want to build this team. And tons and tons of people will reach out and just really start building that team with them because they want to welcome in these new people. They want to grow the Avalanche community and they want to make the ecosystem stronger. Another great reason is just to have fun. If you want to become a developer, it might not be your full-time job and you might just want to learn it on the side. This is a very fun way to start because there are so, so many different things that you can do that it's just a fun journey in general. So now that we've briefly touched on smart contracts themselves, we're going to talk a little bit about Solidity, which is the smart contract language. By definition, it is an object-oriented programming language known for creating the smart contracts on the Ethereum virtual machine. As Gabriel said earlier, the Avalanche C chain is known as the contract chain, so it is an instance of the Ethereum virtual machine where all of these contracts can easily be deployed on the C chain. It is very similar in style to JavaScript, Python, and C++, to where if you are a developer where you have a little bit of experience in any of those languages, it won't be a gruesome task for you to pick up Solidity and start getting to learn how to use it. Even if you don't have any experience and you're still starting fresh, it is not as difficult as other languages that you can pick up. There are absolutely amazing resources out there to help you, no matter what stage of your development journey you are at, to be able to pick up Solidity and learn smart contracts in an easy way. One thing about Solidity is it is an open source project, so it can change very rapidly, meaning that there are always a lot of new features that are added to Solidity, and very often, breaking changes can be added to the code. So whenever you are developing with Solidity and you are looking at either YouTube video tutorials or Medium articles or any online resources, if you are comparing code, you always want to make sure that you check the version of Solidity being used in that contract because if it's different than the one you plan to compile and deploy your contract in, if you copy any code or use any of it as a specific reference, there's always a chance that a breaking change has been made and the code will not behave in the manner that you think it will behave in. So 
Very simple example here. This is an entire Solidity smart contract. It is roughly 10 lines of code, but it's got two functions in it that anybody with a crypto wallet could interact with, and you can see all of the transactions stored on the blockchain. So very quickly, we'll just run through it. The top line is the Solidity version. As you can see, it says greater than or equal to version 0.4.16, meaning that is the lowest level of Solidity versions that it could be compatible with, and up to, but not including, 0.9.0. That means once Solidity gets beyond 0.9.0 and more versions are created, that would still be the max of, hey, don't compile this code with anything more than this because there could be breaking changes in there and this contract is not going to behave in the manner in which you think it will. Next, it is the simple declaration of the contract. You can see that it is named simple storage and that's exactly what this contract is going to be doing. Next is a declaration of a state variable, which is called stored data here. And this is going to be in permanent contract storage. So once this contract gets deployed, that stored data variable is always gonna be there. It could be set and changed 100 times, but as long as somebody goes and calls the get function at the bottom, it will always return some variable. No matter how many times it does get called and changed, because it is a smart contract on a blockchain, every single change that is made to that variable is recorded as a transaction, and you are able to go to that contract's address on an explorer and see every single history of what the stored data variable was set to. The set function is a very simple function where it takes an unsigned integer x and sets the stored data value to equal whatever is input. It is a public function, meaning if I were to deploy the smart contract, anybody in this room who has a crypto wallet that is connected to the smart contract, they could call the set function and they could change its value. It's not just me that has to be able to call the function to change it. Similarly, the get function can be used by anyone as well. It will return whatever the current value of the stored data variable is set to. So that was a very simple smart contract in general, and now I'm going to transition to talking a little bit more about some of the tools that are available to learn how to build these smart contracts. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Open Zeppelin Contracts. So Open Zeppelin is a open source decentralized application building environment that has a ton of different tools that anybody can use to build these smart contracts to then deploy onto any Ethereum-like blockchains. It has a very large library of secure smart contract development modules that can be used to create different types of tokens or smart contracts on Ethereum like blockchains. One of the very cool things about it, it does have role based permissioning schemes to control who can call what functions. So like on the last side where I said the set and the get functions were public, anybody would be able to call them. But there is also a modifier called only owner, which you will see on a slide later in this presentation, which means that only the person who deployed that smart contract is able to go in and call that function. If I were to deploy it, nobody else in this room could actually go in and call that function and use it in a malicious way. Open Zeppelin has a ton of great tools and documentation on all these different components, and one of them that I use on a very frequent basis is called the Contract Wizard. This is a screenshot of the contract wizard for an ERC-20 token. And what the contract wizard is, is a quick way to bootstrap multiple different types of contracts with a plug and play feature setup. So as you can see over on this left side, there are many different features that you can choose from to just plug right into the contract and it's gonna pre-populate that for you. So all you have to do is specify the name of the token you wanna create the symbol that you want it to have and how many get pre-minted at the very beginning. Okay. 
one of the great options for Open Zeppelin's Contract Wizard 2 is right up at the top. You can see that you have options to either copy it to your clipboard to then paste it into your IDE of choice. You can open it in Remix, which we will be talking about shortly next, or you can download it to then be able to put it into the specific folder that you would like to have it in. Before we talk about Remix, this is a little bit more complicated version of a smart contract. As you can see, this is an ERC-721 smart contract, which is most commonly known as a NFT. And on the left-hand side, you can see that the mintable and auto increment IDs features are selected, which caused the contract wizard to automatically import the ERC-721 ownable and count modules based off of these added features. So it knows that there are modules being like the safe mint function and the base URI that are going to be needed. So it imports it all for you so you don't have to worry about finding the dependencies that's needed and having to add them in on your own. The settings for the ERC-721 are similar to the ERC-20 where you will name the um, NFTs and give it a symbol for the collection itself, but then also add the base URI that's going to end up storing the metadata that each of the NFTs will have. But once again, it'll just automatically populate the whole thing in for you once you give it the values that it needs, so you don't have to worry about adding that in yourself. It does have the constructor right here for the ERC721, so it will name them photography and give it the symbol of photo. So as each of the NFTs are created, it would be photo number one, number two, et cetera, for as many NFTs that are in this collection. And here on the bottom on the safe mint is where the only owner modifier comes into place. So this safe mint function is actually what you could refer to as an airdrop function that you use for a contest giveaway. So if you got onto crypto Twitter and said, I'm going to give away one of these NFTs, you could use this safe mint function as is because it does not take a price input, so it mints it for free. And you can specify the address that the NFT is sent to once it is minted. It does not automatically mint it to the caller of the function, that would have to be specified differently. And only the owner can call this function. So say I had a friend who wanted to mint all of the NFTs I made in a collection for free, they could not connect to my smart contract and mint them all themselves. That would be malicious and not very nice of them to do, so this is a way to prevent that from happening. So, As mentioned previously, you could just connect it immediately to Remix, which is an integrated development environment. And it is a part of another learning platform to really bring more developers into the Ethereum-like blockchains and learning how to build these Solidity smart contracts and deploy them and compile them in a very simple, easy way. So there are actually three different ways that you can use the Remix IDE depending on what your comfort level in coding is. The first one is you can just go to it via URL. It is remix.ethereum.org. It is also available as a desktop app if you prefer to just download the application and then run it yourself. Or if you like to use Visual Studio Code, it is also available as an extension directly through Visual Studio. Once you have compiled the contract, there are several different environments that you can use to deploy the smart contract. One of the, you can deploy them to Ethereum, you can deploy them to Polygon, you can deploy them to the Avalanche network. If you choose the injected provider on the environment, you can connect the core extension that Avalanche hosts and now be able to deploy these contracts, interact with them directly through core which you can see right here. The core extension was updated last week with the release of Core Web, and now it allows you to be able to actually connect Core through the injected provider, even though it does say MetaMask, you can still connect Core through that way. And then it will populate with the account that you have connected, which is, you can see up here, 
And once you hit the deploy button after the smart contract is compiled, it will pop up saying you've got a six cent network fee, and that's what's gonna cost you to deploy the smart contract onto the Avalanche C chain. You are also able to specify if you want to deploy it directly to Fuji instead of to the mainnet, but in this specific example, it is just deployed to mainnet. This might be a little bit hard to read, but once you deploy that smart contract, there is a terminal at the bottom of Remix that will return all this information saying that the transaction was successful and you were able to deploy the smart contract. It gives you the transaction hash right here, which is the transaction ID that I was talking about, which would be the receipt from a vending machine if you were to use one. It tells you the address of which the account was that deployed the smart contract itself. This um, will also show up in your core extension if you were to deploy it right through core. You can go to your activities tab and see that a contract call was made to actually deploy the smart contract and you could connect directly to the Snowtrace Explorer from there to be able to view information about it. But then it also gives you information about the gas cost and what was used on this specific contract call. If we were to call the get function here, the, return, the values would end up being a little bit differently. And if you were to call, and it would tell you whatever the actual value that the stored data variable was at the time that you called it. So let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so this really quick is the contract wizard. As you can see, there are actually five different contracts that you can bootstrap and build directly through the contract wizard. The most common tokens for Ethereum network change being the ERC20s, 721s, and 1155s are all available here on where you can go through them. You have all of these different features that you can add to it, making them ownable or giving them roles. And also, you do have the option of giving your contract upgradability. As we said earlier, when we we're talking about smart contract development, most of them are immutable by default, but the Open Zeppelin contract wizard does give you the opportunity of making them mutable and upgradable if you are at that skill level and understand the um, coding and the understanding that it takes to do so. So next thing I'm gonna do is this is the Remix IDE and this is the very simple smart contract example that we pulled up at the beginning. I have already connected um, the core extension directly to this and have compiled the contract already. So you can see right over here, that's the name of the smart contract that you see at the top and my account is populated up there with the injected provider of MetaMask. If I hit deploy, the core extension has popped up a window asking me to approve the transaction. And you will see down here at the bottom of the terminal, the simple storage contact creation is pending and it is successful. So we have this little green check mark here that means great, it was able to deploy. That's how quickly we just deployed a smart contract to the Avalanche mainnet network. <laughs> right over here on the deployed contracts information, Right over there on the deployed contracts information, you can actually copy the address of which the smart contract is. And then if you go right over to Snowtrace, paste that in, you will see that 33 seconds ago, we just deployed the smart contract. So if we go back to Remix, we now see that we have the deployed contract here, and you see that there is the option of calling the set method and the get method. Up here at the top, when we declared the store data um, variable, we didn't give it a value, so it's automatically going to be assigned zero. We hit the get button. It's gonna populate down here and see that it called the function. Pull this up a little bit so it's a bit easier to see. But right here, in the decoded output, there's a value of zero because as of this point, there has not been a value 
set for the stored data variable. If we go back over here to the left to where the orange set button is, we can give it a value of 100, click on set, and because this is a function that is writing data, we do have to approve it and pay a gas fee for it. Once you hit approve, it's gonna pen down here for a second again. And then we get another green check mark that says the transaction was successful. If we go back to Snowtrace and hit refresh, we will see that 10 seconds ago we did make another transaction that was the set method. And if we click on that transaction hash and expand the transaction details, it will show you the hex value down here, which if you convert that to decimal, you'll see that it was 100 that we just entered. But if you wanted to double check, you could go back to Remix and click on the Get button again and see that the unsigned integer value is equal to 100 for the output. Thank you. But yeah, so if you don't want to look at the terminal, you can just sort of look right over here, and the value is also there as well. So now that we've taken a look at two of the very common tools that are out there and available for the smart contract development, I'm just going to close out with a couple different resources that are available either out there for Solidity in general or available through Avalanche ourselves for Solidity and just general other resources that you can use. So if you are a new developer and you're not familiar with reading documentation, it can be a little daunting at first. However, documentation is one of the easiest ways to really get to know a language and understand how it works. I highly recommend going just to the Solidity Lang docs and taking a read through them as it will help you better understand what you're working with. As we mentioned, Open Zeppelin's Contract Wizard is a fantastic tool as you're just getting started and you're not quite sure how to bootstrap those contracts and it gives you the very basic token contracts for all of the normal Ethereum tokens as we went through. But you also had the option, the last option on the contract wizard was a custom contract to where you can click custom, open it either in Remix or your IDE of choice, and it will give you the very basic, most recent version of Solidity, very basic my contract name, and you're able to fill it out as you please. YouTube, there are tons of resources out there on YouTube of intro to Solidity or Solidity for Dummies type of thing where you can just kind of get that very basic understanding of Solidity and kind of seeing what you can do with it to then be able to build upon yourself. I know of tons of different YouTubers who put out really great tutorials of how you can use Solidity and I highly recommend checking those out as well. Plus, a slightly unconventional one is crypto Twitter. As we said earlier when we were talking about just reaching out and saying, hey, I'm looking for a team to be able to build this, the development side of crypto Twitter has been very helpful for me as I've learned how to develop smart contracts or NFTs myself and saying, hey, this is what I'm working on. This is the tool. Does anybody have feedback or could anybody give me tips? There are very helpful people out there that want to see you learn a new skill and want to help you achieve learning that new skill that would be more than happy to peer review your work or work with you and answer any questions for you that you have during your development process. So, avalanche specific Solidity resources. If you go to our developer documentation website, docs.avox.network, there are plenty of tutorials on how to build certain Ethereum dApps. I know for sure that there are ERC20 tutorials and ERC721 tutorials on there, and plus I believe five or six other resources as well on how to use Remix, how to use Open Zeppelin's Contract Wizard, how to use none of them and just completely start from scratch. So depending on whatever your current comfortability is, there is a resource there for you on our development document site 
Plus, you can always reach out to us if you have suggestions or if there's more content you'd like to see, and we'll work on getting those created for you as well. The Avalanche YouTube channel. There are tons of talks just like this one that have been held at several different events previously that are available on the YouTube channel. Even if you are a smart contract developer and you're not quite sure what you want to develop, there are great interviews with some NFT people, with GameFi teams, different partners that we have that talk about their products that can give you that inspiration of, oh, maybe I want to code something like that, or oh, I've got this idea, but I want to put this slight twist to it. That might get those creative juices flowing for you to be able to try it out yourself. Discord, we have a very large Discord server that is really a development hub. There are several different channels, whether you host a node, whether you're a validator, whether you're a developer and you want to learn how to create these smart contracts, you can always join our Discord server, which you can connect to with chat.avox.network. Find the appropriate channel and find a ton of different people who will help answer questions for you or might have similar ones that we'll be able to help you with. One of the things that we'll be getting launched next week is an avalanche form, something similar to Stack Overflow where you can see all your questions linearly. Um, that we hope to be a very development central type of hub as well, because we know with Discord it can kind of be hard to follow along with all the threads where one question gets asked and if it's not replied to directly, you might lose the response to it. So we hope to have that up and running, I believe, next week or so, and that will be a very helpful tool as well. And then while I'm here, and I did mention that I am on the product support team here at Avalanche, um, the support site is the hub for all support articles that might not be development focused, but for the core products that we have. If you have questions for core extension or core web, how to connect to certain marketplaces or exchanges, information about NFTs, all of our frequently asked questions, you can find here on the support site, as well as all of our websites have the little red chat icon in the bottom right corner, and that's how you can connect directly to me and my team, and we can answer questions for you on the fly. Next. Core.app, this is Core Web. I demonstrated how to use the Core extension today. It works amazingly well with Core Web. This product was launched last week. Highly recommend checking it out if you have not done so already. The team worked super hard. They're super excited for this product and it's going to be a fantastic resource now and in the future. If you are looking for generic avalanche information, just go to our main website, avox.network. And if you are a Twitter user, follow all of our main Twitter accounts being the main account, Avalanche AVAX, the AVAX tech support Twitter channel, which is the only official tech support channel that we have to answer questions, and the core app Twitter channel. If you DM any of these accounts with questions, they route directly to my team, so that way we can help answer any questions for you, whether it be a product-specific question, questions about transactions, anything like that. So to kind of briefly summarize everything, doesn't matter what type of development history you have, if you are brand new, if you're an experienced developer, but don't be afraid to just jump in and start building. You have to start somewhere, and even if you're at ground zero, the only place you can go from there is up. So thank you, everybody. Once again, my name is Amanda Marquis. I am on the product support team here at Ava Labs. You can find me on Twitter at Amanda Marquis. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to come up to me afterwards and I'll try to answer those as best as I can for you. Have a great rest of your day.